Hey guys, Tom Moran here from Tom's Big Spiders. This one's going to be very different. Just a fair warning ahead of time. There will not be a video in this one. What I'm going to do here is run one of my podcasts with basically a bunch of pretty pictures of some of my tarantulas in kind of a slideshow format. Uh, the idea behind this is I've had been doing this podcast now since February of last year. It's actually been quite successful, but a lot of people don't know that I do it yet. And I've been talking for a while about bringing some people over, possibly by giving a sample of it over on my YouTube channel. So again, this is going to be different. It's not a YouTube video. For those of you looking for one of my normal videos, this will not be it, but I do have one in the pipe. They'll be coming down the road. Uh, for this one, basically, it'll be me talking about intermediate species. I've done this as an article, which I've yet to publish, and then I did it in the podcast format, which I really, really like. So it's about an hour talking about intermediate species. I know some of y'all put my videos on and just kind of put them on as background noise anyway, so this should probably be okay. Um, if not, please give it a shot. I know it's a longer one, but it's one of my more popular ones, so I think it'd be a good, you know, putting my good foot forward as far as convincing people to come over and check it out from YouTube. So I'll stop talking now. Actually, that's not true. I'm about to do about 54 minutes worth of talking about how to make the transition from beginner species to intermediate species. Hey guys, Tom Moran from Tom's Big Spiders here, about to tackle one that I've kind of had on the back burner for quite some time. A few years ago, I did a list on my website, Tom's Big Spiders, that was best beginner species. And to say it was the most popular article I've written on my site would be an understatement. It still gets a staggering amount of traffic for something that I honestly didn't think many people would see at the time, which is great. And I did put a lot of thought into it. And I've had a lot of people basically tell me that when they got into the hobby and they were just starting out and they had, you know, when you, I think a lot of us forget what it's like to just start out in the hobby and see just how many species of tarantulas are out there. You've got to deal with common names. You've got to deal with scientific names. It can be very, very overwhelming for somebody new to the hobby to just kind of pinpoint what they want to buy and just even many people to start off don't understand the difference between old worlds and new worlds and fast terrestrials and vast arboreals and things of that nature so it can be overwhelming so when I did this list I tried to basically put together the most common species that people talk about when they talk about beginner species now one of the issues I that people have with lists and that I completely understand and that I had trouble with when I was putting together the list is that it can be silly to try to categorize these animals into categories when variants and temperaments even between the same species can vary wild, very wildly. So for example, I have four Brachypelma albopelosum, two of which are ridiculously docile. One the other day, I'll admit to, I was trying to get some feeding videos for a feeding challenge I'm doing in the future. And as I was trying to get the camera set up, it slowly started exploring outside of its enclosure. And I kind of just put my hand out to get it back in. It just crawled right into my hand, no problem. Now, I have two other ones that, although I wouldn't call them defensive per se, they were a lot more flighty and skittish and not ones I would particularly think about handling because I'd be afraid they'd bolt right up my arm. So we can talk about generalities about temperaments with certain species and I do believe that you can get some generalities in terms of say albopelosum. Most people will talk about their albopelosum being rather docile once they hit a, a certain size and that's something that needs to be considered as well that when we talk about temperament I think most of us are picturing adults and not slings because most slings are very quick and very skittish because if they're out in the wild it behooves them to be fast and be able to avoid prey. Another species I can think of that we can generally assume is docile is the Euathlis species red or homeoma species fire. I forget there's two names going around for it. It's probably eventually going to be homeoma but I've had four of these specimens over the years and all of them have been very docile, reluctant to bite they don't kick hairs. I have heard of one instance where somebody got a threat posture from theirs and it was kind of, it was on the forum, it was kind of a funny moment because nobody had ever even seen a threat posture from theirs before. We wonder if they were even capable of them. But for the most part, you can kind of generalize characteristics around certain spiders. OBTs, the P. murinus, for example, another one where it has a bad reputation. Now, I would argue in some cases unearned, but we'll get into the OBT in a future one because I do want to do just a podcast on those. But generally speaking, if you pick up an OBT, expect a personality that's as fiery as its appearance. So we can kind of deal in some generalities when it comes to temperament, but I do think it is important to note, and it is a valid argument, that it is very difficult to recommend 
one spider over another uh, and over another when talking about beginner species because they all vary. So I, when I talk about my list was one species, I did my beginner list that I left off for quite some time and that was the Aphonopelma calcotis. And part of it was because my Aphonopelma calcotis female, my first one that I got, was an adult, I believe probably wild caught, and she was not particularly docile at all. She would kick hairs at the slightest provocation. She was very uh, reclusive. She would retreat to her burrow. If you caught her outside, she would scramble around. She was rather skittish. And I had talked to many other people that had the same experience with them. However, I think what happened is as they got in the hobby and people started raising captive bred slings, it seems like their temperaments ease off, or at least that's just... It's just a guess of mine, a, a theory, but it seems like people started reporting just total dolls, little fluff balls that will sit in the palm of your hand. So a lot of people were getting upset because that species wasn't included on my list. But again, I was going not only by my own personal experience on these, but I would search up when I did this list, I did a lot of searching up best beginner species and going through numerous forum posts and Facebook group posts over the course of the years to see which ones were the most recommended. I, I wanted to use, I always use my own experience when writing about uh, tarantulas, but I also thought that this was one that was much, much bigger than my limited experience. We need to hear what other people say. So I called in all those names. Top two were easily Brachypelma albopelosum and Uathlis species red as far as tractability. They also had E. campistratus, the pink zebra beauty popped up quite a bit. But then we brought in another issue to the list is availability. So we have to start taking into account how easy are these things to get a hold of. Now, unfortunately, I created kind of a monster with the Uathlis species red because I promoted the snot out of those several years ago when they were readily available in the hobby. But since then, Chile has banned export of their species out of the country. So so the wild caught adults that you were seeing, and this is a good thing. I don't want this to come across like I'm bemoaning the fact that we're conserving the species. Not at all. It's a very good thing. But unfortunately, the wild caught adults that everybody was buying for a decent amount a few years ago are now gone. So now we have to raise this the slings. And by the sounds of things, we're having trouble producing enough to support the hobby. And the slings are so teeny tiny that people are shying away from them. So there are a lot of factors that go into these lists that make them very difficult to do and again can can lead to the argument that any list is just not particularly useful i've heard that argument i don't agree with it but i get where it comes from another species when uh issue when doing lists is a lot of people talk about the ladder system and the ladder system in tarantula hobby is basically means you start with a certain type of species. You'd start with a beginner species, usually one of the slower growing Brachypelma, Phonopelma, um, Gramostola species. One of the, the general ones are usually considered to be the best beginners. And then once you get some time under your belt, and they even have some, at some points, like suggested times you should be keeping before you graduate to the next rung, then you pick something up a little bit faster. So you might go for an Aegeniculata or a Lasiodora parahibana, something of that nature. Then you move up a little quicker, a little further, and then you might pick up a Salmapoa species. So the idea is that, the idea, not idea, I can't stand when people say that, um, the idea is that you work your way up by starting with very simple species and then a little more advanced, a little more advanced until you're able to deal with the most difficult difficult and possibly defensive old world species. Great idea. Unfortunately, I'm one of the folks that believes that the idea that you get a Salmopoas or Tapanakinus Kenya species before a pokey, um, it doesn't necessarily work that way because I find my pokies to actually be more easily managed and more laid back than most taps and Salmos. I mean, that's just my own experience. And I've kept, I have, I believe, three species of Salmopeus. Uh, I believe I have one, two, three species of tap, two species of taps, and they are much more skittish and defensive than the majority of my pokies. In fact, I, I've yet to have a pokey that has given me anywhere near the hard time I've gotten from the other two species. That's something to be considered there, like which should lead into what? Should it be taps to pokies or pokies to taps? I think a lot of us to keep the Pisolotheria species would say pokies are taps. So then another like monkey wrench in the whole ladder concept idea that it doesn't always work out the way it should or seems like it would on paper. 
So to get back to my original point, I gave a lot of thought to putting together my beginner species list. And the only lament I have now is that both the video version and the text version have been out. They get a lot of traffic off of Google and YouTube, and I would really like to update them. But unfortunately, I don't think as many people are going to see the updates as they do the old versions. In fact, I tried to do an update of my text version in which I kind of rejiggered the order and added some extra species to it. And I put a big thing on my original post about beginner species about please check this out first. I made some changes and it doesn't get nearly the traffic the other one does. Because people click on a link, they're, they're doing quick research. They're not going, all right, I'm going to click on another link. I read another one. I, I get it totally, but it just kind of stinks because these are kind of locked in stone right now. And there are some changes I'd like to make. So anyway, about a year and a half ago, these lists were really starting to pick up some traction. I was getting a lot of comments on them. And somebody's like, hey, you know, I've, I basically used your beginner species list as a shopping list to get my to build my collection. I've got a huge collection now, and I'm looking to get into the intermediate species. Could you please do best intermediate tarantulas? And I was like, that's a fantastic idea. I've actually given some thought to it. It's time to get going on it. So I sat down to make my list. Well, here we are, probably a year and a half later. I don't know the date on this. Yeah, it's been about a year and a half. And still have not completed the list because it became very problematic. Now, I do plan on finishing it this summer. It's up on my desk right now. And it is something I really want to do, but I think it requires a lot more explaining than the beginner's list. The beginner's list, I set up basically my idea for beginner's list is I had several questions that I asked myself before a tarantula made the list. So for example, number one would be temperament and possible tractability. Can it be handled? Is it one that usually has a good temperament? Because unfortunately, as many of us out there do not handle our tarantulas or don't recommend handling tarantulas, and I'm, again, I shy away from this debate because I can kind of go both ways. I personally don't handle them that often, but I just admitted to having one in my hand earlier, so sometimes it happens, but I've been doing this a while, and I feel like every once in a while if one of them crawls my hand, so be it, but I don't make a habit of picking them up like I would, you know, a bunny or a hamster or something I'm going to show somebody. I kind of treat them like you would aquarium fish, but anyway... A lot of people getting into the hobby, they're new to the hobby, don't know this. They are under the assumption that you are supposed to handle. It's part of having a pet. I did a whole big, I think, podcast. One of the uh, points of it was how when I first got into the hobby, I was under the impression that you had to handle. And that was, like, if you didn't handle it, you weren't a true hobbyist. What is the point of having it? And I realized that's not the case now. So I do believe temperament is very important. So when creating the beginner's list, temperament was right up there. And then second, but no less important, was to consider the level of care. There are some species out there that I think are fairly laid back, but if you have to start dealing with moisture requirements and uh, fossorial species, things of that nature, that can be a little bit more difficult for somebody to handle, not to mention somebody that's getting a tarantula. And I know because I can remember the feeling when you're buying a tarantula, you're going to show it off to friends and family. You want something they can see. And when people come over and you're having a party, they go, hey, break out that spider of yours. Granted, you should do it responsibly and, and with respect, but they're going to want to see it and you want to try to convince them that these are cool animals. You don't want them staring at a hole in a pile of dirt. It just doesn't work well. So there are species I think that you could literally plant in dirt, have no issues with whatsoever that would probably make good for beginners except for the fact that they need to be kept moist and they dig and bury and you don't see them. And another thing I had to take into consideration that I didn't the first time I did the list, and it's becoming more of an issue now that the markets have changed a bit, is the availability and price of species. People getting into the hobby are shocked to find out that some of these things can cost $250, $350, $400 a sling. So I, I think it's important to pick slings that aren't, you know, 100 bucks each, ones that are readily available or species that if you find as adults, I think people need to realize that if you buy an adult, especially a sex female, you're going to pay much more for it, but can be around the $100, $150 range as adults. And, you know, ideally 30 35 40 bucks tops for a sling. So I think that's something to be considered. Um, unfortunately, again, you can't always control market prices and some of the ones I put on there, for example, uh, Ecamp Estratus was, at the time I put it on the list, was very prevalent. You could find it anywhere. And then there was like two year period you couldn't find them anywhere at all. And people would email me, hey, Tom, I'm hoping you got connections. Can you get me one of these? It's on your list. I'm dying to get it. And I'm like, no, I can't even get ones for myself. It took me a while to get my own. 
Um, the aforementioned uh, Euathless species reds are other ones that are difficult to find now. And at the time I made this list, they were everywhere. So unfortunately, that can be tough and it might force me to go back and change the order of the list. And to mention the fact that, you know, Euathless would be good species to start with, but the slings are very teeny tiny and you can't really find the juveniles or subadults anymore. And finally, I think other things you have to consider are their propensity to fast. A lot of these species will take a lot of time off eating. And again, I personally think we've all gone through the fasting thing. It's almost part of the hobby to have something that fasts. You have to learn it one time or another. But it, I agree completely that it can be a major turnoff to somebody that's just getting their first tarantula to, because we all expect them to eat like normal animals, like a dog. You're going to drop a cricket and it's going to eat it. You're going to do this every day. And the whole feeding thing can be very confounding to someone who has just plunked down money for an animal that hasn't eaten in four months. Potency of hairs, I think, is important. A lot of people getting into the hobby have no idea about the hairs, the urticating hairs. I had somebody contact me the other day on my, my beginner species list, and they're like, hey, great list, thanks so much. I have a question, though. Why do you keep talking about getting haired and herring? What does that mean? And it didn't even occur to me that people wouldn't know about the urticating hairs on New Worlds. And speed, I think, is a big factor. I have a lot of people that contact me about their super hyper fast GBBs, their C cyaneal pubicins or cyaneal pubicins. And I, I don't giggle because I remember what it was like to have mine and mine was fast, but they seem to think that those are like the be all end all as far as speed is concerned. And when they'll ask me like, hey, you know, you just posted about your H David Bowie spider. How fast are those compared to like a GBB? And I'm like, well, they, they could like run laps around the GBB and they're like floored. So I think speed for those of us who've been in the hobby for a while and have kept some of the advanced species and seen what they can do when they really get it into their minds that they're going to boogie. And to see a GBB being talked about as one of the faster ones, you start to go, oh, no, you're not even close. But I think for somebody just getting into the hobby, that's an incredibly important consideration. If a lot of people think that the GBB is a super fast spider, then they need to stay away from some like the D. diamantiensis that are ridiculously fast or the teleporting ones like the tappies. That's something they will probably not be prepared for. And again, not passing judgment. It's just a fact. So when I came up with my beginner's list, I also tried to envision like a 12-year-old boy or girl that was interested in keeping a tarantula for a pet and what they would be able to take care of reasonably without too much parental guidance because a lot of times the parents are like, all right, we'll get you a spider. I'm not doing anything for it. So those are all the things I put together to come up with a list of how to, you know, get a good beginner species and I felt pretty confident in the ones that I picked the one thing I would go back and probably redo and talk about more is the fact that if you get one as a sling per, or, or, as opposed to an adult there are differences but I think overall it was a solid list but one I do plan to tweak in the future because you know it, things change and as I keep more species and as I talk to more people there are different things I would tweak in it so now that we've discussed a bit about what I did to come up with the beginner species Let's talk about how I started to come up with my intermediate species. So having defined and identified the criteria for what I thought constituted a good beginner, I then tried to break down what would make an intermediate species, what would be a stepping stone to some of the more defensive species. So I, I started off with very simple, a good intermediate species should be one that doesn't quite fit the criteria for a beginner species. Let's start there. Let's just narrow it down. So I would go through a list of some of the things that, you know, some of the attributes it would have and try to figure out, all right, does that not fit beginner species? If not, it's automatically bumped into intermediate and we went from there. So right off the bat, we had to eliminate old worlds from the list. And basically that's because are there old worlds out there that are probably more laid back than new worlds? Absolutely. But unfortunately, you have to consider the venom and that kind of takes, you know, it takes the old worlds basically right off the beginner, spe uh, the beginner species list. And quite frankly, my thought is a off the intermediate species list. Bottom line, if you make a mistake with one of these guys, this is going to be your first time with potentially more defensive, faster tarantula, you don't want it to end you up in the hospital in excruciating pain. So that eliminated a bunch off the bat. Another thing we wanted to look at was the temperaments. Now, with beginner species, we wanted ones with laid-back temperaments. With an intermediate species, we're looking at something that's going to be a bit less predictable in terms of its disposition, with some of them being outright ornery. So these are species that, if startled or threatened, may resort to throwing up a threat posture, maybe even exposing some fangs, and might even do some hair kicking. 
And speaking of hares, the interme intermediate species may also have the more potent hares and can be more likely to use them. And I know a lot is made of tarantula bites, and the biggest question I get about species when somebody's researching is how bad is the bite? Because I think a lot of people assume you're going to get bitten. And if I'm going to be completely honest, when we first got my first OBT, I was talking to Billy like, uh, you know what, I got a funny feeling I'm going to get bit. I'm going to get bit. And that came from inexperience. My thought process now is knock on wood that if you, you know, play it safe, the, the chances for bites should be absolutely minimum. But that's an important thing. What people don't talk about is the hairs. Now, I got haired one of the first times ever in my keeping career by an LP last year. And apparently I'm more susceptible or more um, sensitive to the LP hairs because it was it was fairly nasty. Now, I used to work in fiberglass. I used to work on fiberglass boats doing repairs and gel coat and the structural repairs and things of that age. So I've been itchy before and the majority of the hairs remind me of having the fiberglass dust in your skin. However, this one was different. My I actually had little pussy like with boils, like little little blisters on my fingers. It itched like crazy, just like a burning itch and it lasted almost a week. And actually I have a scar from one of the spots because I tend to scratch things until they bleed. So that's something that needs to be considered. If the hairs are particularly bad and there are some species out there renowned for their really bad hairs, people need to be aware of that and that's going to make it a little more difficult to deal with. So a lot of the species we talked about in beginner lists are kind of laid back. They're capable of bursts of speed, but they're generally containable. Some of these species of tarantulas have startling speed. Personally speaking, I think that speed should be a major consideration and factor in certain species being more intermediate species. And again, I point to the case of the GBB or the C. cyanio pubicans, which I did include on my beginner's list at the end tail end of it because a lot of people do get them and are successful. But I do think that spider ends up being the introduction for many people to the more skittish, defensive, and possibly bolty tees, for lack of a better word. So although all tarantulas are capable of short speed bursts, spider speed is not a myth, they can boogie. There are some that can literally be out of a cage and loose in your house in a blink of an eye. You need to be aware of that. And then I think another one to consider, another point to consider for the intermediate species is max sizes. Um, some of the species get to be quite large, and that can be very intimidating for somebody who's new to the hobby. You get a 5-inch spider throwing up a threat pose, that's creepy. You get a 10-inch Lazydora parahibana or a Theraphosa sturmi throwing up the posture at you, that can be frightening. And I think that's something that needs to be taken into consideration when determining an intermediate species. And then husbandry-wise... I think most of the species on the list should be relatively straightforward with most doing well in the beginner conditions, you know, the dry substrate water dish, but I think a few of them will benefit from some moist substrate. So you'll start getting into that idea of moisture dependent teas and the fact that some of them you do need to keep moist. So for these spiders, the other one I pictured, a 12-year-old uh, boy or girl who's getting into them. For these, let's think about the adult keeper who has successfully raised some of the beginner species without incident, incident and has perfected his or her basic tarantula husbandry. I talk about that a lot, that I think a lot of the benchmarks for getting into the more difficult species isn't so much I feel ready, is, is are you able to do basic husbandry without an issue and without it getting out of control? Are you able to do your rehousings? That's a huge one. I think that's your gauge right there. If you're rehousing a B. albopolosum and your heart rate is through the roof and you're sweating, you're not ready to move on to something else. I'm sorry. Some of these species, they're going to bolt. They're going to boogie. You're just not going to be ready to deal with that kind of stuff. And I think that's something people need to look at. If you're rehousing your things, you just rehouse your GBB, you drop the cup over it, slid the cardboard over, moved it over, kicked a couple hairs, you went, oh, look at it, it's kicking. Let me get a couple pictures. You're comfortable, you're confident. Then that's when you start looking at moving on. So I think that's an important thing to look at. So when once again, when trying to put together this list, I thought about my own experiences and as well as other keepers. I do, one of the luxuries I have with doing this whole Tom's Big Spiders weird thing is that I get to talk to a lot of people. A lot of people from all different countries, a lot of people from all different backgrounds, a lot of people have kept all different species. And I tend to be a sponge when I hear things. So sometimes, unfortunately, I can't remember who said something, but I will remember somebody said something. And that allows me to kind of add that to my knowledge bank. So I did take my own 
uh, experience as well as other people's experience to come up with this and then just thought about what behavior or upkeep makes them more intermediate which species are comparable and which advanced species would these help you prepare for that's how i tackled it which species are comparable so if you're are you looking for arboreals are you looking for terrestrials and which species would they help you prepare for because a lot of people are like i want to tease stormy how do i get there I want to keep a piece of Letharia species. What should I keep beforehand? And I don't have a ready answer because my path to getting there was probably different from a lot of people's. It depends. So the idea this time around is to give folks a heads up as to what type of behaviors and issues they may encounter and to discuss, discuss which more advanced spiders they could be getting valuable experience toward. So here's what you can expect and here's what you'll be working toward. So to kick this one off, I'm going to backtrack just a hair because the last two species I had on my beginner's list are also could be considered good intermediate. And I'm going to throw a third one in. The borderline species, the in-betweeners. The first, I would say, is the green bottle blue or GBB or the Chromatopelma cayenne pubescens. Great stepping stone spider for some of the reasons I already mentioned. First off, this is one of the ones that has blue in it. Everybody is trying to get a blue tarantula as soon as they get into the hobby. And unfortunately, blue means stop in this hobby because a lot of those guys are the ones with the, you know, crummy temperaments and the speed and or fossorial. It just... You get the piece of Letharia, the arboreal ones that can be skittish and have a nasty bite. So a lot of times people see the blue spiders and they're not the most appropriate ones to start with. However, you have the little green bottle blue. What makes it a, what makes it potentially a good beginner species? They are tough as nails. They're one of the few slings that does well bone dry. They grow quickly. They eat like machines. Uh, just an amazing spider to look at. A lot of good things going for it. But what makes it more of a challenge? Well, they are very skittish. Many of them are very skittish. Not at all that tractable. You can't really hold them. And many of us have specimens that will kick hairs without the slightest provocation. I have two females that used to be very, very docile until they hit like young adult stage. And then they both went through a molt and then they both went through a bratty period when whenever I even looked at them, they were kicking hairs. They are also can bolt very, very quickly. And again, we talked about earlier how these are ones that a lot of people that are new to the hobby talk about being um, extremely fast. So that can turn some people off. So they kind of skirt that borderline because the thing that kind of puts them into the intermediate category Category for me is the potential for a little bit of attitude and the speed. Those are two things that can really turn people off. However, the reason why I originally added them to the beginners list is I get contacted by a lot of beginners who started with them and do fine. So I can't just ignore that point. So I think some people are ready for them, although I've had people contact me say they scare the heck out of them. It could go either way. So those are ones that are borderline T's. Another one, Canthoscuria geniculata. I, this one is probably the most recommended one that I get from people who are like, I can't believe you didn't have this on the list, and I will be adding it to the updated list. But again, I think it's a borderline species because they do get very big. They can have an excellent feeding response. They can kick hairs, and people have reported ones that have a bit of an attitude. Now, again, this is kind of a could be a potential for a rather large hairy nasty spider which could turn people off however the care is very simple people used to keep them all moist some people keep them dry now they do just as well they are very hardy amazing eaters if you want something you want to break out a beautiful spider that you can break out for friends and go this is what a tarantula can be because again most people just think they are big brown hairy spiders that's going to be a spider you're going to look at and it's going to impress some people they're just gorgeous specimens and eat well, grow fast, so a lot of good things going for it there. But again, the temperament and those hairs can be a bit of an issue. The next one that was on the list as far as an in-betweener would be the L. parahybana, Lasiodora parahybana, or the salmon bird eater, LP, pink salmon bird eater, whatever you want to call it. They are gorgeous. They are hardy. They are readily available. I have two that I got from freebies. They Most people report theirs are just monsters as far as eating, monsters as far as growth rate. The issues with this spider is that they can be a bit coy when they are younger. I've had, I get more emails, I think, about LPs burrowing as slings and disappearing than any other species. In fact, my own experience, the first spider that ever freaked me out with its burrowing behavior that I... It was one of those ones that was just like your typical noob doing research online, looking like my spider buried itself, my LP buried itself. I haven't seen my LP in a month. My LP was the first one to bury itself, completely cover over the opening of its cave and just disappeared for a while. 
Luckily, I held off of it, but it freaked me out. So this is one that as slings, they will burrow. And I think a lot of people, when they hear descriptions of these specimens, they are thinking about adults. And we forget to mention sometimes that they can be different as slings. And I think this is one where it happens with quite a bit. So between the slings burrowing and the adults being eight inches plus, that can be something that can intimidate a new keeper. But besides that, again, they're tough as nails, readily available. They look great as adults. They sit right out in the open, and mine are actually quite calm as adults. The hairs do bother me, but apparently not so bad for other people. So that's something to think about. Everybody's going to have different reactions to different hairs. It just apparently depends on your own body chemistry. Now, are there other species that can probably be thrown in the quote-unquote in-betweener category? I'm sure there are, and this is where it gets difficult because there are certain species that seem to be like, depending on what type of temperament you get, they can be the best beginner in the world, they can be the worst beginner in the world. But what we're going to do now is move into some of the categories that I tried to come up with so that people would be more tuning into the behaviors they'd expect rather than just the moniker intermediate spider. So the first one I looked at is I called it twitchy terrestrials. And these are the kind of medium sized new world species available on the market. But not all of them make a good starter tarantula because they basically offer a step up in speed, skittishness, and some of the behaviors, attitude, some of the behaviors that mark a more advanced species. So the first one I have in this list, and a lot of people ask me about these guys as beginner species, and I tend to shy away from it only because mine don't fit the category, and most of the people I talk to that have them, they don't quite fit the category, although they might be more in line with the GBB, but the Brachypelma bami or BOMI, the Mexican fire leg. This is a beautiful Mexican species with stunning colors, and unlike some of the other Brachys, this species actually grows at a medium rate. So those who pick up slings can look at, you know, a species that's sporting its adult colors in two years as opposed to like five, six, seven, depending on the species. And they won't have to wait as long to have that stunning, leggy adult that everybody sees pictures of. Now, as far as challenges... I'm sure some folks are going to take a double take and kind of go, wait a minute, what, what are you talking about? These guys are great beginners. But there, it's. I know it's a brachypelma. I know we generally assume that all brachies are beginner species. But I found that these guys are very fast, nervous, and very quick to kick hairs. I've had three of them. One of them is actually a brachypelma. Baby Brocklehurst, not, not Brocklehurst, the Baumgartney, excuse me, I had the Brocks in mind hybrid and it's very nervous quick to kick hairs i have a juvenile now that i've had for about three years same way nervous a little less kicky but will bolt around the enclosure as soon as i open it and i've talked to other people that have the same issue so that's something to be considered when getting a tarantula that this one might be when people look at some of the ones like the hammer eye or the amelia or the classy they are expecting them to be like tractable your typical beginner species these guys offer a little bit more in terms of behaviors problematic behaviors just a bit so again i could see this one going either way but this is the way i leaned with it and their hairs supposedly something to take into consideration they're not only re not reluctant to kick their hairs but their hairs are supposedly quite bad i've never gotten haired by mine but i've seen my larger one kick up a cloud of hair she is starting to settle down a bit as an adult but still not one i'd stick my hand there in with so to start off this is a good one for people that have raised all the you know the quote unquote pet rocks i think this is a good stepping stone species kind of on par with the gbb the next one i think is one of the best personally i think intermediate species as far as terrestrials and that's the Terina pelma sasme or the brazilian blue this is a medium-sized new world terrestrial that shares the distinction of being one of the blue new world species a lot of the blue world species uh, the blue world that's going to be a new one a lot of the blue species that people see and want are old worlds and therefore knocked off the beginner and intermediate species list but this is one that's a new world species and i get a lot of people that will comment on my videos on these guys oh great can i pick one of these up is this a good beginner species now it's what makes it a potentially good beginner species is that they are from a region that gets a lot of saturating rainfall 
but alternated with periods of drought, which means that they are hardy in variety of conditions. So it's not necessary. I, I kept my slings moist and uh, juveniles partially moist, but as adults are mostly dry and every once in a while I overflow it. So the care isn't that difficult. They are very hardy, very adaptable, and most of them will stay out as adults. And biggest perk, they're blue. Everybody loves the blue spider. So there we got a blue spider that's not going to put you in the hospital if it bites you. However, behaviors and challenges. I've heard a lot of people, and we kind of joke about it, and I actually called them little jerks on one of my videos, and it was it was amicable term. It wasn't meant to be mean, but somebody took a, a offense to it. But they can be very skittish and defensive once they put on some size. As slings, they weren't too bad. They would just go to their burrows. As adults, I have gotten more threat postures from my pisosome than any other species, and some of them will be aggressive threat postures where they've got the fangs out, and they're kind of coming towards you a bit kind of like back the heck off. So although most tarantulas will bolt to their burrows when disturbed, the beginner species, I've had my pisosmates just stand their ground and even advance, which can creep people out. They are also quite quick and quite skittish. So sometimes they'll throw up a threat posture. Next thing you know it, they're bolted almost out of the enclosure. So not particularly a great beginner species, but I think an excellent stepping stone to baboons, as far as I'm concerned with mine, especially some of the quote-unquote beginner baboons, if there's such a thing, and I am going to tackle that one eventually through video and podcasts as well. So my next category was diminutive and defensive. So the spiders in this category aren't going to be the biggest spiders in the world, and most of them are quite small, but they can be little tiny terrors due to their defensive behavior, skittishness, and speed. But I think a conscientious keeper and a careful keeper who has mastered their basic husbandry and care, including transfers, that's the big one, would really love these guys. They're delightful little lookers that I think just add a little bit of extra challenge. And so with their skittishness, speed, and in some cases defensiveness, these guys are a good lead up to some of the less ornery baboon species like H. villicella, E. pachypus, M. balfoury, and C. darlingi. These are ones that little quick guys that'll get you ready for some of that old world speed. So to start off, my favorite one to recommend is the Hapalopus species Columbia Large Pumpkin Patch. I have not kept the small clines, so if somebody wants to chime in if they've kept both on the difference, that'd be great. I do have to pick those up because I love these guys, but I've not kept the smaller version. But these guys are kind of a budding favorite in the hobby. They're very prevalent in the hobby now i just my last sack i had almost 400 babies which i sold through a number of dealers so there's a lot of them still out there they're a small little tarantula with an amazingly unique personality um just you can tell they're like the little chihuahuas of the tarantula world kind of and these are one of the species that uh, people will talk about bolting out of their enclosure as opposed to into their dens when they open it but we'll get back to that in a minute and an incredibly unique appearance i think they're just such cool looking little guys they almost look like giant like true spiders almost they start off tiny as slings, but they eat like machines. Slings will take off, take down prey almost the same size as them, and they grow very, very quickly. I've had a male mature out in 11 months, I believe, So, and the female's about two years. So you're talking about a faster-growing species. And this is a species that, if given the space and anchor points, will usually produce copious amounts of webbing, which people love webbing, and they create little dens, and they bolt out of the dens and eat. It's just a lot of fun. So awesome species, but behaviors and attitudes that uh, challenges to get them on the intermediate list is, again, despite lacking the size, these little demons pack, pack plenty of attitude. And although they're more skittish than defensive, I would say, many report their haplarge is making a break for the breach as soon as the enclosure is open. This has become a running theme of these guys bolting out. I have another Hapalopus species that does the same thing. She escaped the other day. I went to open her feeder. She was out of the enclosure and on my arm and off running across the table before I could even blink. So they will try to escape, which can be, you know, I can get the blood pumping for people that are new to the hobby. Husbandry rise as species should be kept moist when smaller and probably up to juvenile stage. I, I, they're now the general consensus is they can be dry as adults as long as they have water dishes. But I did just lose an adult to a bad molt. I don't think it was due to lack of moisture though because I continue to keep part of the substrate moist for my adults at all time. But something to think about. So I personally advise giving them some damp substrate. But great species as far as a stepping stone to the faster slightly more defensive species like baboons. 
Another good one, Neo Holotheli Insti. I just got a communal of five of these from Rachel Pan of Fear Not, and they're doing fine so far. They are sold in two color variants, same species, just different colors, and it's normal and gold. And this pretty little dwarf species is generally very shy and reclusive, with specimens quickly darting to their burrows if disturbed. If you give them a bit of substrate and some things to web to, they'll web the snot out of it, they'll have a little burrows underneath. And this is also one of the species that is thought to be very communal. They are been observed being kept communally or living communally in the wild. People have some success in captivity keeping them communally as well. Behaviors and challenges, these guys are fast and they can make rehousings an adventure. This is the first species that during a rehousing I had that managed to get out of the enclosure and into the catch basin. I have a, a larger Tupperware I do all my rehousing in and it got off into one of those. So they can be quick and they will throw up a threat posture if cornered. So something to think about. But again, that gets you used to that speed. And once you see these guys move, it's like, oh, I see what they're saying now as far as terms of when we kind of giggle about GBBs being fast. Some of these guys are really fast. Next one, Dalicotheli diamantiensis. I think I said the first one right. Please correct me. D. diamantiensis or the Brazilian blue beauty. Absolutely stunning species. Some people call them mini GBBs. My buddy Brad hates that, but they do look like little mini GBBs. But uh, quite simply, one of the prettiest tarantulas on the market. They have metallic blue legs, green carapaces, and a shock of red on the abdomen. And like the GBBs, they're also prolific webbers. So for people that like their enclosures blanketed in white, this is one you definitely want to check out. They are smaller, so they're not a, an intimidating spider. I believe under four inches. I have uh, two now. They're about three and a half or so. They start really tiny, but again, they eat great, and they grow very quickly, and they pick up those adult colors very quickly. So you don't have to wait forever until you can you know, enjoy some of that blue beauty they offer. So a lot of good things going for them. Fairly, for, as far as behaviors and challenges, overall, these guys are fairly laid back, but they are fast, and especially as slings. This is one that I actually got a warning from. I bought these from uh, Fear Not Tarantulas, and Tanya put on them, be careful, they're fast, and she wasn't kidding. They gave me a little bit of a run for my money when getting them housed, and if they get disturbed, they bolt. So again, another one that can get you used to working with a fast, possibly unpredictable tarantula, which I think is crucial if you're going to be working with old worlds. The idea is you're going to go into the more advanced species, not with when I get bit, but I'm not going to get bit. I'm going to make sure I don't get bit. So working with these faster species helps you prepare for things like Salmopias, which are so fast people have called them teleporters. So this one, these Diamantiensis, I'll tell you, they can move. They're almost like teleporters. They can cause trouble for anyone. So so I think they're good stepping stones there. So now we're going to move on to what I call the big boys and girls. This category includes some of the larger species available. So for folks looking for something bold and beautiful to display, they would be wise to search up one of these massive spiders. In some cases, these species would fall into the intermediate category just by virtue of size. And as we talked about earlier, a 5-inch spider with a bit of an attitude is one thing. An 8-inch spider, that's a whole different challenge. Believe me, the 3 inches make a lot of difference when you're talking about spiders. As always, temperaments from specimen to specimen can and always will vary, and such is the case with the species on this list. Although many report they have gentle giants, others find themselves greeted by threat postures, clouds of itch-inducing hairs, and just general attitude. So these guys aren't particularly known as being speed demons, but you have to remember that an 8-inch spider can move, and i tell you, some of these guys can move very, very quickly. So what's next? The falling spiders would make good stepping stones toward Panthobedius and eventually those Theraphosa species. These are ones that I would recommend people keep for a little bit before getting into the true giants. So first one on the list, we have Formictopus cancerides. Everybody's probably going, oh, of course, but we'll open this up to any Formictopus species. You can find cancerides tend to be the cheapest and most readily available on the market, but I'll tell you I've kept other ones that are actually probably better as far as stepping stones and some that could almost be beginners because they're actually more laid back as far as for mix or concern but these are so much more than a big brown spider the cancerides has been the hobby for years and it gets overlooked quite a bit because it's got the reputation for being just a big brown spider but slings are gorgeous blue and have some of the best feeding responses of any tarantula.
tarantula species I've ever kept. And as they grow to adults, they go through many profound and beautiful color changes. Adults are large spiders with some females reaching eight inches and larger specimens make fantastic display tees as they have no problem sitting right out in the open. They're like giant rose hair tarantulas. In fact, a little fun fact here, a lot of them are accidentally sold as rose-haired tarantulas in pet stores that have no idea what they're doing half the time, which can make for quite the shock for somebody thinking they're going to get a little six-inch spider that they can hold. Although the slings, I think, benefit from the moist substrate, adults are incredibly hardy and can be kept terrestrially on dry sub with a water dish. And most of my adults, actually all of my adults, none of them even use their hides after they hit about five inches or so. So what are the behaviors and challenges? Well, one of the turnoffs is its notoriously cranky attitude. Slings tend to be more nervous and more bolt, but their bursts of speed are, are, are quite impressive. But as far as adults are concerned, besides being very food aggressive, and I'm talking about these guys, you drop in food, you can watch these guys move. We did the feeding challenge with Mark Tarantulas, and the one of mine that I thought won that uh, that round was a formictopus species, and the speed it whipped around and grabbed a roach was amazing. Um, I've also heard many stories from keepers, and every time I talk about how nice my Formictibus are, somebody comes in with stories about how not nice theirs are, but about them actually charging out of an enclosure at the keeper. So that's some scary stuff right there. And although they have an abdomen full of the urticating hairs, I've found that mine would rather throw up the threat posture and bear some thangs and slap some legs rather than kick hairs. I I think I had one kick and I keep seven species of Formictopus or seven species subspecies and that's it. I've had one kick. Next up on the list would be Nandru chromatis or the Brazilian red and white. This is a fairly large tarantula with some specimens reaching seven inches. The N. chromatis is another excellent choice for keepers looking for a beautiful showcase spider. This species is medium to fast growing sports, black and white striped legs, a cream colored carapace, a brilliant red hairs on its abdomen, and a feature that some will argue set it apart from the similar looking Aeginiculata. There's a big argument about which one's better, I'm not going to get into it. But it, they've just gorgeous, gorgeous spiders and something that when you take out and show somebody, they're so unique looking that your friends and family are going to be like, wow, that's not, I did not expect a tarantula to look like that. Um, adults retain some of the skittish temperaments of slings, but most will spend plenty of time just sitting right out in the open. My girl now is probably about three and a half, probably four and a half inches or so, and she's generally right out in the open, although she will bolt to her hide when startled. And the chromatis is fairly common in the hobby, and slings can be purchased for 20 bucks or so, which is great. Behaviors and challenges, the end chromatis has a reputation for being fairly skittish and potentially defensive. And again, this is a bigger spider we're talking about. Spiders given a hide would usually rather bolt and hide than stand their ground. However, caught out in the open, they won't hesitate to throw up a threat posture. And this species is also widely recognized as having some of the worst hairs of any New World species, second only to Theraphosis. And that comes up quite a bit that the hairs of these guys are very nasty. I'm lucky that I have not had any experience with getting haired by mine or having any, you know, picking up water dishes and getting hairs on it by proxy or whatever. But I have heard a lot about them being very nasty in terms of the reactions people have to their hair. So again, something to think about. Now let's move on to the arboreals. I threw this one on because I kept one of these after looking at them for quite some time and I thought they'd make a nice little jump up, although some people might say they're more on the advanced side. But the Iridopelma hirsutum, which I believe is called the Amazon ribbed. Interesting. Um, this is a spunky little New World arboreal that starts off as a colorful sling before turning into a fuzzy blonde adult. Uh, it's a medium-sized species arboreal that grows very fast and does well in a basic arboreal setup. So a nice little introduction to the arboreals. Although slings will appreciate a bit of moisture, the adults are generally quite hardy. In addition, a bit of rain every once in a while is appropriate. A bold species, this one usually sits right out in the open, which makes it a really good display spider. So for somebody looking to get into the faster arboreals, this is where it's at. Now, behaviors and challenges. This is not generally a friendly spider, and folks used to cute little arboreals like Avicularia species will find the species to be a nice step up to more fast and feisty, feisty tree spiders. Not only will the hirsutum throw up a threat posture with little provocation, but they've also been known to jump when startled. So let that sink in a bit. You're keeping a spider that can actually jump, maybe end up on you. So something to think about. They are also quite fast, which can make rehousings and maintenance a joy. So when looking at these guys, 
I'm looking at a spider that will get you ready for some of the uh, larger, potentially more defensive arboreals without necessarily the terrible bite. The actual upkeep of them is fairly easy, which allows you to kind of move into some of the other species. And I do think if you can rehouse one of these, you're probably in good shape with some of the other more advanced arboreal species. Next one on the list, one of my favorites, Salmopoeus cambridgei or the Trinidad chevron. This is a beautiful and hardy arboreal species. The P. cambridgei is fast growing, easy to care for tarantula. They are very widely available in the hobby. In fact, I got mine as a freebie. I actually tried to keep my cost under 200 bucks so I could get one as a freebie and I'm glad I did because I've got a big beautiful female. It's one of my favorites in my collection. And the slings, when you find them, are like $20 or less. You can sometimes pick them up for 15 bucks. So very readily available. They're hardy as slings. You like to keep them a little bit moist. As adults, I do like to make it rain every once in a while, but I let it dry down in between. I will miss the side of the enclosure. A nice big water dish for them. They do stay out, at least mine does, is mostly out in the open all the time. So I see her all the time. Beautiful colors and just an amazing spider all around issues with them again you've got speed you're introduced this is a fast arboreal they can be defensive although some people report very calm specimens mine happens to be a rather calm one i can open that cage do maintenance everything she just kind of flattens herself out and sits there um, some people have ones that can be a little nastier so you can get threat postures and these are guys that supposedly have a little nastier venom and when they throw up a threat posture they will strike. Some species I've noticed will throw up the threat posture but their fangs aren't out. They're kind of slapping to keep you away. They're not planning on biting. These guys apparently will use a bite if they feel so inclined. So we've introduced a bit of speed into the mix as well as the potential for defensiveness. Again, and I would say an alternate to this would be the Samopoeus polker, or polcher, I've heard it pronounced both, I believe it's polker, but which are a blonde species of Samopoeus, and these ones might even be a little bit better as far as a stepping stone. Again, they can be quick, but they don't seem to be the least bit uh, defensive. I've heard folks say that theirs are very, very calm. The problem with the pea poulters is they tend to hide a bit more than the Cambridge eye, and I'm sure people will chime in and go, mine's out in the open all the time. I have one that's out in the open, most of the time, if you pick up the enclosure, it immediately hides. I have another one that stays pretty much hidden. But this would be another one that would help you kind of as a stepping stone to get you ready for, I would say, probably Tappy's next, Tappanicinius, or Peace Lotharia, which is just one that a lot of people are trying to build up to. Now, again, I have a hard time with the ladder system as far as Peace Lotharia is concerned because I do think on one end you have the potential for one of the nastiest bites in the tarantula hobby, on the other end, they're not particularly inclined to bite. The, the, you have to be aware that the threat is there, but I think they get demonized a lot and people talk about how nasty they are and they don't seem to be particularly inclined to bite. They'd rather use their natural camouflage to hide. But I do think the P. Cambridge eye or the P. Polsker would be a good stepping stone, especially with the rehousings because you are going to be dealing with pulling out a lot of ornaments the you know water dish clearing the space trying to cup these guys whatever technique you use and get them out into the new enclosure and i think that will be valuable experience for when you get to the piece of Lotharia to get you used to the rehousings because th that those are species that you need to feel comfortable with and confident with when rehousing them so that pretty much covers where I left off with this intermediate species list. I tried to cover species that would get you ready for baboons. I tried to cover a species that would get you ready for the faster old world arboreals. And I tried to give you species that would get you ready for the larger terrestrials. So those were the three main categories I looked at as far as stepping stone spiders. Now, that said, this is where you guys all come in. I'm not even going to pretend, I never would, like I have all the answers. I have kept, I think, 135 species of tarantulas. Now I'll have to double check, it was 125 or 135. Um, but that's just scratching the surface of what's available out there. So I have very limited experience of my own to go on. I think 135 is obviously a lot of species of tarantulas, but there's still so many I haven't tried. So what I'm hoping is that while I've got the Word document of this list up on my desk, I would like to finish it this summer, and I'm reaching out to folks. 
what do you think would be good intermediate species or stepping stone species? We can have, I would really like to have a healthy little debate on this. I may even, I've been looking to post one of my podcasts on YouTube just to try to entice people to come over and check out the podcast because apparently there are a lot of people that still aren't aware that I do one. But the comment section of my YouTube page usually blows up when I put up a video, which is great because we get some awesome discussions. But here's my question, you guys, help me out here. What are some of the species that you would recommend as intermediate? I'm not going to pretend like I have all the answers. I don't. I think I have a pretty good foundation of a list here, but there's a reason why it's been sitting on my desk and not being added to for probably over a year now. I started about a year and a half ago, but I picked it up not too long ago, and, or about a year ago, and added some more stuff to it, but it's not done. I don't feel like it's ready. I don't feel as confident with it as I did going ahead with my beginner species. So the call is out. Who's going to help me out here? What are some species you would recommend? Do you think this is a solid list. I will be hoping to finish this up by, uh, personally, I'd like to have it done by the end of the month and post it on Tom's Big Spiders to start getting it out there. And I would love to hear people's feedback on it so we can put together a better list. And again, this is a situation that I did not, or a luxury I did not have when I did the beginner species list. I did not really have the forum where I could reach out and go, hey guys, help me out. What do we got? So let's make this list as potent and as accurate as possible so I'm not looking at it three years from now going man I wish I changed a bunch of stuff to it so my question to you guys is what do you think make good intermediate species for those of you that have just made the jump or keeping intermediate species now or for those of you that have been in the hobby for a while which species did you use as stepping stones let me know. I'll add them to the list. So let's make this the best list possible. And again, Tom's Big Spiders isn't about me going out there, going look at what I know. It's about being a reputable resource for people getting into the hobby. And my beginner's list, I did a lot of homework trying to look up species that people recommended. So it wasn't just my word on this one. It's a little trickier of a topic. So I'm reaching out to you guys. So hopefully some people chime in and hopefully I remember to actually post this up on my Facebook page this time. Because again, I usually ask people to respond to them on Facebook. And my buddy Eddie Marquis reminded me by posting on my page that I did not post it last time, which kind of defeats the purpose of saying that at the end of these videos. So again, let's get a discussion going here. Maybe I'll throw this one up on uh, YouTube as well to allow people to respond there. Keep it civil as usual. I don't want this blowing up, but I'd love to hear your feedback. And again, if you're not aware, I do have obviously the YouTube channel and tomsbigspiders.com where it all started. And please feel free to check out either of those two sites for information about tarantulas. So that's it for me for now. This was a bit of a longer one because the last one was a little bit shorter. And I'll catch you guys all on the next one. All right, again, I'm gonna. one of these days I will come up for a, with a slogan to end these things. I kind of get to the end and pitter out. And it's between this and the video, it's getting embarrassing. So thanks for listening, guys. Catch you next all right, time. If anybody's stuck with that whole thing, I really appreciate it. Again, uh, this is something I do in, in addition to the videos. So it's not, don't think I'm going away with the videos. I'm not. It's just a lot easier sometimes to do the discussions in the podcast format rather than me talking and trying to find video to put together to make a video on it. However, this is one I do want to turn into a video to kind of accompany my one on beginner species. Now you can find my podcast just about anywhere podcasts are available. It's on iTunes. I have it on Buzzsprout's my main one. It's all over the place. I'll put some links in the description down here. And again, appreciate everybody for taking the time to listen to this one, not watch it, although hopefully those pretty pictures, you know, made it worthwhile. So anyway, that'll be it for me for now. Again, if this is the first video you've ever watched of mine, this is not what they're normally like. Usually there's a lot more spiders and things going on, but I appreciate it. Um, you can find actual videos here and here, or you can subscribe up here. As always, thanks so much for watching, or in this case, listening, and I'll catch you guys all next time.